welcome to swimming in the microservices ocean. Um, so just uh, let's uh, start from uh, uh, the beginning. I'm actually Luca Moraski. I am uh, uh, working for uh, uh, Nearform, and uh, you can find me basically everywhere in the web with this handle that is Luca Maraschi, very simple. And uh, uh, I am a member of uh, the Node Postmortem, Postmortem uh, Working Group. Uh, as you could have seen maybe in my previous talk, uh, I focus mainly my interest in uh, uh, postmortem activities and uh, uh, in uh, looking into core dumps and everything related to that. So, but let's start this story. Uh, like everybody, I had a dream. And this dream actually was a very ambitious one to have a resilient and scalable with almost no maintenance cluster. A little bit like my dream of how to keep take care of my house, right? To have a nice Roomba that I power on <laughs> in the morning and takes care of cleaning my house. Well, like every fable, we need to start with once upon a time. And we all remember and we all know uh, where every story started, right? We had the monolith, uh, that kind of one piece big aggregated application running on most likely something like this in the picture, a mainframe. Well, this one is not the mainframe, but every mainframe is black. Um, and actually, fun enough, if you put in Google um, the term uh, uh, monolith, you actually find something like this. And I don't know how, if it's fate or things that might be related, but yeah, that's exactly how the monolith uh, ended up, to be a kind of single block who's there with only one function. And uh, we all know that actually this model along the time actually started to fail. And more or less it failed from a different uh, uh, perspectives. And many angles actually they made it not really successful. So well, thumbs down for the model of the monolith. Uh, when actually I was uh, studying at high school and was studying uh, uh, Latin, uh, actually something that then later in my uh, uh, university, I studied physics, actually came back as a, as a concept, as a principle, was divided et impera. And it's actually a, a sentence created by Philip from Macedonia. And he actually is one of the core concepts of how uh, to win uh, wars. And it's actually very simple, right? He says, if you divide, if you actually uh, take a big problem and divide it into tiny, tiny, small, small one, you are going to actually conquer them because they are so easy to manage, they are so controllable, you can hold them in your hand, and that's where the power comes. So we all know what that means, right? Microservices. So we went from the monolith to the microservices area. And microservices, actually, we all know they became very soon hipster, a very hipster term almost holistic, that nobody exactly knew what they, uh, they really were representing. Um, and one of the concepts that propagated with the terms of microservice was actually the, um, the idea of stateless application. But uh, if you look actually how a kind of normal, average uh, microservice application um, most likely architecture, sorry, looks like, is actually that we, we have an initial uh, entrance from the outside of the world, so like HA proxy in this case, a lot of different microservices, and they all connect to uh, one kind of state container, right? Redis, most likely with uh, uh, Twin Proxy or React, right? If you want to make it fancy, React. Um, the reason being that React actually has a, a strong concept uh, that is, is one of its primitive type uh, is a vector clock. But uh, this concept of being stateless actually didn't really mean uh, that our entire system would be resilient, right? Because we still had one single point of failure, our state container. One other big problem of this uh, 
uh, architecture is service discovery, right? Um, how do I basically map all my microservices inside of my topology? How do I find them? And, uh, you know, many other kind of uh, initiatives started, right? So Consul, HTC actually being the, the most famous. You can also do service discovery with Nginx and uh, upstreams, right? Um, but the main question that still was on the table was about coordination, right? It's a distributed system, and the core problem of a distributed system is the coordination. Well, we all hope that our application, they get super successful, right? And, you know, if they become super successful, it means that many, many people are using them. And many, many people using them most of the time means uh, scaling horizontally uh, our stack of services, right? So you have many, many, many more machines. And, you know, this one is just Google um, data center. But still, one of the biggest problems stays the coordination and the distribution. Uh, you know, you have, you can have a million servers, but if you don't have the logic to equally distribute the load across this million server, you just are going to utilize only 0% or 1% of your entire stack, and it's going to crash because it doesn't know how to basically leverage the load that you're pushing on your services on multiple machines. One of the answers that we got, actually, in terms of uh, uh, horizontal scalability came from uh, Amazon with AWS, right? It made elasticity one of the answers to scalability. I can scale elastically my service, almost with no cost. Well, until the end of the month comes and the bill comes to your credit card to be paid. And uh, Amazon actually developed uh, uh, two components in their infrastructure offer, being the Elastic Load Balancer and the Auto Scaling Group. Oh, I mean, it's arguable how good they are, but that was their answer. So, in a nutshell, uh, I have a load balancer in front and I have some kind of policy of scaling uh, underneath it. And I say, uh, once the machine gets really, really hot, and this one you can do it with CloudWatch. An alert is sent to the Elastic uh, uh, Load Balancer, which notifying, well, actually to the Auto Scaling Group, uh, that basically enlarge the scaling and propagate this information to the Elastic Load Balancer, adding an extra node or two or three or n to the uh, to the to the scaling capabilities. Along this way, um, in the magic world of transformation of infrastructure, uh, big player came in and I think was one of the biggest, uh, not really a revolution because it's a very old concept uh, coming from BSD, right, the jail in BSD. And this one is the container, right, so we have many, many different uh, flavor of containers right now and uh, um, the most successful and the most famous clearly is Docker, a mod with the open container. And uh, uh, Docker represents a huge turning point into how we actually saw uh, deploying uh, and uh, managing application. So before we actually took our application and push it uh, straight into an application server, this one is the world of Java, right? You want to forget about it, it's a nightmare. And with Node, uh, what we did, we actually pushed this process inside of a machine, right? Single process inside of a uh, very small machine. And Docker, what did, it says, well, we, if you we put an isolation model on top of it, and we can still actually imagine that we are uh, living on a, on a real physical machine with a single processor with an end set of uh, resources. And we can actually abstract the complexity of hardware because we can say that it works on my computer so that my own local machine is exactly the same copy as my production server. And uh, looking at what an average or let's say, most solid uh, um, continuous delivery pipeline looks like. So this is an example taken from uh, an e-commerce website, Vacom. And they're not actually deploying Node.js, they're deploying um, Python, but using actually Docker containers. It's pretty, pretty interesting on how the orchestration looks like, and as you can see, everything is, is circulating and is orchestrated by Marathon and console. 
but still this model is missing of something right the, the resiliency there is no fault tolerance uh, how can I make my application extremely solid uh, how can I reduce downtime and how can I make sure that if one component falls down everything continues working without any problem Consul and the way uh, service discovery uh, system they're working they're mostly they're mostly going with a failure detection by orbiting what means is that is a continuous ping on the machine are you alive are you alive are you alive are you alive until it doesn't die and it says what well, is that so what we do we just take and remove this address from the available addresses in the address map the problem is that still is that the state uh, of the cluster might change all the time, right? It's a very mutable, very flexible model. And that's where it comes in place a very smart thing. A group of students from uh, Cornwall University put in place uh, this white paper and created this protocol, SWIM. So SWIM is scalable, weakly consistent, uh, and is a gossip protocol. So let's try to dig a little bit on why this thing is super powerful, right? So we said that the state of the cluster might change all the time. And we know that it's changing all the time, right? And let's go word by word on what that means. So SWIM is a scalable, weakly consistent, infection style membership protocol every one of these four lines has a very very important role in distributed architecture first of all the cost of weakly consistent versus strongly consistency is a core element in distributed architecture to higher fault tolerance but especially resiliency right we we in the modern world even even bank account they are weakly consistent the stronger consistency is actually brought to the to the data through uh, basically a reconciliation. So reconciling the entire set of data uh, through all the events in the night. So it's always a kind of post-processing operation. Failure detection over the cluster is basically done because uh, uh, it's a gossip protocol. So imagine that uh, if one peer goes down many peers are notified so there's no central point of failure in managing and orchestrating this thing but every single node of the cluster is responsible of the overall topology of the entire cluster so it's highly distributed so if it, imagine something like uh, the resiliency of git you delete the repository but if you have two or three collaborators that they already have it offline you still have a copy somewhere that you can push and restore from that state uh, the core element uh, of the resiliency and the power of uh, a gossip based uh, um, environment is the fact that the information is disseminated across the entire cluster so when the state or when an information is pushed on this uh, kind of cluster yes it's propagated equally in all the cluster so all the cluster has all the information about all the different peers and with this thing it comes that we can really balance because we uh, if every single node has the knowledge of all the other peers it's very simple to basically create a very smart algorithm of load balancing around it so in a nutshell it was born for the modern distributed system sounds all like magic at this moment right and well actually to be very honest it is a, there is always a little bit of magic in all this thing but there is always a problem right not every fable can have a very very happy line but they most likely always have happy ending so what happened when I add a cluster when I add a node into the cluster right my cluster needs to elastically scale and I add an extra node to this cluster what what is going to happen well the main question to ask our ourselves is 
how can I rebalance the topology of my cluster? So how can I make possible that every peer knows about this new peer just added? And how can I rebalance the load across it? Well, that's where a little bit of magic powder comes in place, right? And that's a consistent hashing. Um, consistent hashing, it's a, a kind of very uh, tricky mathematical uh, quiz. Uh, but let's imagine it in this way. Let's keep it simple for everybody. Uh, the consistent hashing is just uh, a way of sharding information in a cluster. And uh, what that means is that uh, uh, through basically a shard key, I can basically um, dedicate and uh, I can direct information to specific section of uh, my cluster. So a little bit like uh, if you are thinking, uh, closing your eyes and thinking a little bit outside the box, uh, a little bit like every peer-to-peer -peer almost network, right? We, we can find the seeder and everything in this huge network. And we know exactly how to basically uh, go, uh, we know exactly where to go to get part a particular um, segment and section of my basically buffer. So the main concept is basically the one of partitioning and sharding of uh, an hash ring. Um, one of the main concepts that we can introduce, once again, is a predictable elasticity, right? So we basically can easily uh, determine uh, how to basically route information and load uh, in our cluster, because we basically can build this path, right? And the most actually important thing is that we take, uh, um, we take a huge step and we make our application uh, stateful, because we basically can distribute and push the state directly inside of the application. Uh, Surf uh, from AshiCorp is uh, uh, another, um, let's say, uh, way of gossip and distribute information. Um, is basically uh, the the technology behind the uh, console cluster. Just to say something a little bit more close to uh, the knowledge of everybody. But, uh, you know, this problem is not a, a problem that uh, is so theoretical, it's not so holistic, right? There are companies like Uber that added this concrete problem. So if you think that Uber has a uh, um, million of events uh, running on their own platform, right? And uh, uh, the main problem is how can we basically make our uh, basically how they can make uh, the entire um, system highly resilient and fault tolerant because it has always to be up and running, right? You don't want to basically crash while you are uh, asking for a, um, for a cab. And so dispatch actually, to solve this problem inside of the dispatch API, um, Uber came out with the idea of RingPod. It's uh, application, uh, application layer sharding uh, uh, framework. Uh, and actually, uh, RingPop as a, a kind of competitor, if you want to call it in this way, that is UpRing, um, is actually developed by uh, Matteo Collina, and is uh, um, an extremely interesting uh, uh, piece of software because one of the main problem of uh, RingPop is is own complexity, something that UpRing trying also to solve. Uh, um, as a first class. So Upring has, is a very simple to use uh, framework uh, uh, compared with uh, uh, RingPop. So the main, the main thing is that right now what we take, we take all the complexity and all the logic of how to distribute load in a cluster and instead of pushing it outside in third-party components, instead of having to uh, deploy different uh, you know, appliances inside of our infrastructure, we take it all in app. So our application is fully accountable and responsible of, it, of itself and is a part of a cluster of other similar application. It's basically bringing the concept of distribution in an eventually consistent world. 
so a super actually complex uh, uh, problem before like how can I equally distribute the workload you know round robin algorithm they are not as strong uh, uh, as you might think right because they are just uh, balancing with a simple you know next 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 algorithm while distribution inside of uh, um, an hash ring on top of clearly of a gossip uh, distribution it's super super powerful because we actually can predict uh, load we can predict uh, uh, faults uh, and we can avoid paths that they might end up into high latency right because if it's if it's a failing node clearly will not respond as fast as a healthy one and uh, just just to go a little bit more practical because it sounds all you know theoretical um, what happened is that uh, applic application level sharding means that the application himself knows uh, uh, based on a shard key knows exactly where to direct uh, uh, the uh, the request and where to get the response from inside of the cluster Let, let's imagine that we have three node instances and we have uh, they're all running uppering uh, and we are asking basically for a shark key that is shark key is the user ID and is a, ideally is a user uh, is a user service so it's just a simple get user uh, what actually um, the application will do is that uh, uh, will basically try to rebalance uh, to balance inside of the cluster this request they will say can I answer as a node instance one this request uh, yes or no if yes means that my user ID is between 0 and 100 I will answer it directly else I will forward it to the next can the next do it and uh, uh, the balancing of uh, the, the cluster is based basically on similarities so which means that we guarantee that max in three hops we will always get the answer that we are looking for super powerful right um, to hold actually this uh, beautiful uh, uh, story uh, there is something that makes also in uh, in uh, Uber all this magic uh, possible. It is uh, uh, Ikerban. So the problem is that uh, you need to have an overlay network. And for example, in Kubernetes you can do it. In Swarm you have Docker network. Uh, but uh, uh, in the case of uh, um, Uber. Uh, the second component that was crucial for them to uh, to run the super scalable, full tolerant application was Hyperbot. So what they did, they actually built this network overlay to basically uh, replace uh, HA proxy and Nginx. And they say, well, we hit directly our layer seven, so our application, and himself basically, the application is aware of the entire uh, network topology. Uh, Hyperman is still one of the mystery of Fatima, so something that we will know and uh, we will not know until uh, the world is over how it really works. But it's definitely a super powerful uh, library that I recommend everybody to look. And if you can ever decode what's written there, please come back to us and tell us because we are still trying to decipher uh, that piece of code. Um, Hyperban uh, actually. Um, like I said, it's a super powerful uh, uh, component. Uh, is actually allowed to uh, put a layer, uh, kind of uh, a virtual layer, network layer on top of all the microservices, and uh, is basically uh, making possible uh, um, to abstract completely the network topology. So it's actually, jokes aside, a super super powerful uh, uh, component. But now, all this thing works uh, also because uh, uh, Uber ditched HTTP. Yes, that's a secret. HTTP is uh, terminated at uh, basically the API layer and is converted into T-channel request uh, across all the system. T-channel is a network multiplexing and framing protocol. Um, it's um, in a nutshell what it does uh, is a kind of uh, custom homemade brew um, TCP implementation uh, which contains actually uh, extremely useful information 
So T channel is basically uh, bridging and bringing the RPC uh, to a world where HTTP was dominating. Uh, and it allow actually basically it solves most of the problem of a uh, highly distributed system with uh, thousands and thousands of services that is uh, once again the coordination so one of the first class citizen of uh, this protocol is the possibility of uh, supporting out of order responses and uh, um, what he also does he actually uh, contains uh, um, together with Hyperman a vector containing all the peers that uh, can be reached as next to allow basically this uh, next discovery in a super super fast way plus uh, and I think is the one of the most important uh, point uh, um, traceability is one of the core component of T channel and just to make it more representable, uh, one of the problems of uh, uh, microservices and distributed architecture at scale has always been traffic management, right? So you always want to be able to uh, see uh, where uh, every single request goes, uh, how it goes. You want to see the bottlenecks of your request. And it looks like actually it's not a good idea um, to take the highway to San Francisco, outside San Francisco in the early morning. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look uh, a little bit, uh, if you close your eyes and try to imagine what we want to see is this huge map where we can basically see all our requests floating left and right. And that's ideally where we want to go right in a microservice. We want to see exactly what is going on because auditability and traceability are most likely uh, one of the key things that you want to consider when designing uh, uh, for massive scale. Um, another white paper that really uh, I think it's worth uh, reading uh, before going to bed, it's one of the best reading you can get, fall asleep in a second most of the time, uh, is this white paper. It's actually from Google, um, it's a very very uh, engaging uh, uh, discovery um, uh, and it's actually uh, the Dapper protocol uh, is basically embracing and uh, summarizing uh, uh, basically every single wheel that uh, any person working with microservices and uh, uh, once again distributed architecture and distributed system uh, wants to uh, to have and is uh, traceability formalized and uh, well Dapper is the white paper and uh, uh, Twitter uh, came out with uh, an implementation of this protocol that is uh, Zipkin. So out of all this talk, I think this slide is what you really need to take down, note down, Google it and start implementing uh, in your microservice, in your whatever service, whatever, whatever thing you're doing with HTTP, just use Zipkin. Um, T channel uh, as a full uh, uh, implementation of uh, uh, Dapper, uh, but if you're not using T channel, I, and I seriously don't know why you should use it if you're not working in Uber, I would definitely recommend you to uh, keep an eye on Zipkin. Um, it's it's a lifesaver. Uh, the main question is why actually moving to RPC, and this one it goes more into uh, philosophical part and my point of view. Um, I would say why not, uh, but uh, what actually we are trying now to do and is, we see is a market trend and is, is becoming a new uh, trend is uh, basically this distributed system there are nothing more than a bunch of containers running business logic. On top we have a routing logic, we have overlay networks, but at the end of the day what we write uh, is just plain and simple function with an input and an output. So the main question is why overload the entire uh, request uh, flow with HTTP? Why not terminating and use HTTP for what is strong, that is kind of uniform communication across the web? And why not just make using a protocol that makes really meaning and has its own strength, right? And I think RPC is perfect, right? If you think about uh, 
what an RPC is like in the world of Java is when you have, when you call a function in a different jar, the same stuff, right? When in Node you require a module and you basically make a remote call to uh, another function. AWS actually took this concept uh, uh, really, really far with AWS Lambda. Well, one of the problem of Lambda is that uh, it's a black box and it only runs on AWS. Right now, there are other alternative um, OpenWhisk from uh, IBM and uh, uh, Iron Functions from IronIO, I think, are the only alternatives and the only real implementation of uh, basically functions as a service. Uh, but they all try to bring this concept, they try all to abstract basically the complexity of running servers, right? And so this term serverless came in, right? DevOps free serverless. It became in in few seconds it became the new hipster term. And well, you know, like all the hipster stuff they have short life most of the time. Uh, but the thing is that it's not really real what they uh, kind of announce. It's not true that you can throw away your DevOps. It's just that you abstract the complexity of managing a server topology. You don't have to decide for the hardware. You know that it's a container. It's an abstract container that will run with no problem your function at scale. I think actually if you look uh, a little bit more ahead, you see that basically distributing this function is going to be the future more than uh, than anything else. So I, I can see that uh, um, systems that are based on uh, uh, SWIM and the consistent hash ring, they basically already start to abstract the, the clustering and part of the coordination right in distributed system. Uh, they basically abstract uh, some of the earlier complexities. But still, I think the world where we are heading to is not anymore the world of microservices where all these complexities are still there in a limbo, right? It's, there are so many actually uh, philosophical way of solving the microservices uh, problem, but practically an infinity of different flavors and not really a good one. Uh, while actually if you look more ahead, the most efficient way of seeing the future is to think that uh, in the future we will basically be writing uh, all the infrastructure will be basically inside of our application and we will abstract the complexity once again of uh, the hardware. Um, and what we end up writing is just this input output function, very efficient and we, we start to basically abstract all the underlying complexity on how to run them. Thanks a lot for uh, listening to this uh, story, this fable, this holistic view of the world. Um, I hope you enjoyed. I hope I gave you some uh, hints on where to look at and maybe uh, bring up some of your curiosity on investigating uh, some of the things that I described. And please uh, feel free to uh, shoot all your questions to uh, the Near Forms uh, uh, Twitter account and uh, uh, looking forward to answer you. Thanks a lot.